Hi everyone, welcome to another session of Tuesday Times Roundtable, aka Zoom Table. We are super excited to have you. Um, it's so good to see you. So many, um, so many known faces. Um, we miss you guys. It's awesome to check in with you one, at least once a week, right, and have these conversations. We are super excited. For those that are new and don't know, Tuesday Times Roundtable has been done for years. 11, I think, to be exact. Um, on campus, and given the situation, of course, we are continuing that uh, via Zoom, and um, these um, sessions are sponsored by the New York Times. If you don't know us, an FIU student, you can um, have free access to New York Times. You can see the information on the, on the PowerPoint, but also we'll include it on the chat. Um, we have... Oh, so these sessions, we do them weekly, every Tuesday. Uh, we have some uh, important reminders. Of course, uh, the TTR, the Tuesday Times Roundtable is recorded. Um, it's not mandatory to use your camera. Of course, we want to see you. We want you to participate. But again, just do it as you're comfortable. But please feel free to um, turn on your cameras if you feel comfortable because we want to see you. Uh, share your questions in the chat. GL medallions, Global Learning Medallion um, students get points. Um, and Jenny is going to talk more about that. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Tuesday Times Roundtable. Again, my name is Jenny Simon. I'm the program manager over at the Office of Global Learning Initiatives. Super excited, as Florencia said, to be able to see you, those of you who, who um, have your camera on, and those of you who don't. You do what you got to do. Uh, I know that you're here and that's uh, still super important to us. I just want to, to have a quick reminder for those students who submitted their graduation request forms that I will be uh, contacting you. And if I did, feel free to just email me back regarding the, the deadlines for receiving your medallion this semester. And also that, as Florencia mentioned, Tuesday Times Roundtables, you can receive one point. Um, for each session and that moving forward this semester and in the future semesters, um, you will need to participate in at least four Tuesday Times Roundtables toward your activity points requirement for the medallion. So we encourage you to, to join us um, whenever you can. I think that's, that's all for now, Flor. Thank you. And um, let me see if I can, there you go. So today, as I was saying, the Tuesday Times Roundtable, the, the, we have been doing this for, our office has been doing this for 11 years. So today we have an extremely special session because we have Eric Feldman and I'll, I will introduce him properly, but I just to give you um, uh, an, a brief um, background. Uh, Eric used to run the, the medallion program and he used to run the Tuesday Times Roundtable. So, um, we are very lucky to be able, you know, kind of like we are coming full circle now. We invite him to, to talk, but this was his baby. Um, and also, he's in DC. Uh, and the fact that soon now in the, the conditions, yes, we are limited in so many ways, but at the same time, they're giving us so many opportunities. Uh, and, you know, now we can, we can have Eric uh, leading this session. So if you don't know, the, the session today is called The Influence Industry, Who Congress Listens To and How to Raise Your Voice. Um, Eric Feldman, he's the Associate Director uh, for Student Success in Academic Programs at FIU in DC. He leads the Talent Lab, which trains the FIU community on the workings of the federal government and policy making. The flying seminars, internships, and the impact series of events he programs focus on the skills of communication, emerging technology, and global learning, which are essential to career success in Washington, DC. For eight years prior to this, Eric managed. <laughs> I'm so sorry, guys. That's my daughter. Um, so for eight years prior to this, Eric managed the signature student programs associated with FIU's Global Learning for Global Citizen Initiative, including the Global Learning Medallion, to the Times Roundtable, and Peace Corps Prep. Eric currently serves on the advisory boards of two Washington, D.C.-based organizations, Pay Our Interns, which advocates for pre-internships, and the Lecto Foundation, a new app to inform voters. 
During his time in Florida, he also served the Miami community as an advisory board member of Church World Services Miami, Immigrant and Refugee Program as a volunteer college coach for Peer Forward. Eric is a doctoral candidate in FIU's Department of Education Policy Studies, where he's collecting data on the role of place and space in internships, and he has had the opportunity to publish on topics related to higher education, including law enforcement on campus, publicly engaged scholarship, democratic deliberation, and social media. Thank you, Eric, your family. Thank you so much uh, for being here today. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's a, it's a pleasure to be back at a Tuesday Times Roundtable. And, um, you know, I'm going to start by saying, hey, I, I'd love for anyone who feels compelled to introduce themselves in the chat and to say what drew, drew them to this topic to do so. I'll, I'll read those as I talk and um, I'm trying to share my PowerPoint here, but it's freezing up a little bit. I'm glad to know what draws you to this. I also noticed that there's at least two people in here that work for a member of Congress currently. I think I'm totally frozen. So, uh oh. Yes, you are. Um can't see anything. Oh, we can hear you. You can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. That's something. We'll see if this, uh, we'll see if this recovers. Might have to come back in. And in the meantime, the students in the chat are saying, hi, Eric, good to see okay. you. Can't wait to hear your presentation. So you know you have an eager audience. <laughs> Yes, and he has always his own fame club. <laughs> we are so excited to have you. Trying to force. But. This is the gift of technology. Well, in the meantime, if anybody wants to ask or send some comments or questions in the chat so we can we can start thinking about some of the reasons why you are here. I know some of you are graduating and <laughs> trying to collect the final points, but uh, hopefully some of you also are interested in, in FIU in DC, what the program offers. Some of you are already have already interned there or work with Eric. Some of you are exploring possibilities for the next year or semester. Um, He's back, sorry. Back? Yes. I was just trying. Okay, so we have someone in the chat saying, what's, what's FIU in DC? I'm new here. Awesome. Uh, so to Eric, that's a be the best segue that you right. really have. It is. Uh, if you guys can give me co-host ability again, I'll try one more time on my PowerPoint. And while we're doing that, I, I wanted, I'm on Instagram right now. I'm, I'm on Instagram because one of the uh, congressional interns that FIU has this semester with a member from California posted something on Instagram that I thought was kind of relevant to why I wanted to do this, uh, this course, uh, uh, this topic. And it's a tweet from someone else who says, as a citizen, you do not choose to have political influence. You already have it. Therefore, sitting out of politics doesn't absolve you out of the blame for a state of politics. You sitting out is your choice about how to steward the responsibility you have been given. Um, and so I think that's kind of a message I'd like to get across uh, during this conversation is, um, how to be more involved and things of that nature. I am gonna start by answering that question of what is Washington, FIU in Washington, DC though. So we are part of FIU's Office of Governmental Relations and we are based here in the nation's capital. Uh, we represent the university in federal, you know, issues and partnerships and priorities. So uh, my, my colleague, Carlos Becerra, is often meeting with uh, congressional offices and federal agencies about FIU research programs and everything from Latin America policy and cybersecurity to clean uh, water and the environment. So that when FIU researchers are doing great work in these areas, um, the, in the, the research FIU is doing can inform the legislation of these congressional offices based on the knowledge that FIU pr uh, professors have come up with or that there could be opportunities for FIU research to be funded. 
We also do a, a series of events up here under normal circumstances called the Idea Exchange, where we invite White House officials and federal agency officials and think tank researchers to come to dialogues on topics with FIU students and faculty, uh, which uh, transcends just the student area to represent FIU as a leader of new thoughts and ideas in, in some key areas in the nation's capital. And I run the Talent Lab. The Talent Lab is kind of what you're experiencing today. That's everything we do with our students and alumni to help uh, with internship and career placements in DC and also uh, professional development. Uh, opportunities to help you learn more about how DC works. Um, so all FIU students can intern in DC and I'm available to help with that. I'm going to talk a little bit later about our Hamilton Scholars Program. That's an added layer of support for interns with an extra scholarship and a course. We'll talk about that later, uh, but whether you do that or not, you know, we can help you find and apply for internships here. And we do three-day fly-in seminars on a variety of, uh, of topics and issues, and we're doing them virtually. And I want to make sure that, uh, that you know, half the people on this call apply for two fly-ins that are open right now. Uh, we're working with the Black Student Union on a fly-in called Breaking Generational Barriers to Black Leadership. We are going to be having meetings with Black business owners, uh, with people from federal agencies that support minority-owned business, uh, with members of Congress who are either part of the Congressional Black Caucus and or working on racial justice type legislation, uh, as well as with a number of kind of nonprofit and advocacy organizations in this space. The Leadership Conference on Human and Civil Rights is gonna play a big role in this one. So um, that's up uh, for applications the rest of this week. And we've extended the deadline for this other flying. It uh, is now through this Sunday, the 20th, uh, which is um, the future of equity in health and beyond COVID as a catalyst for change. We'll be, be exploring through a similar series of meetings with governmental and non-governmental points of contact about how the pandemic and the 2020 election might influence uh, in health and other areas, including education and transportation, uh, the, the march towards uh, more equality in those areas. The website for both of them is flyin.fiu.edu. You can go there, get to the links for both of these. Uh, please take advantage of applying to one of these uh, programs uh, over the rest of this week. I would love to see your applications come in about that. And some more questions about FIU and DC at the end. I have a couple slides there. So my overall thing that I, I wanna do is, is talk a little bit about how the federal government works then move into how people try to influence the federal government, then use that to talk about, okay, you know, how can you influence what the government does? And then if you're so interested in this area of things that you'd want to intern or work here, uh, how can you do that? And how can FIU uh, help you do that? Um, I put a why question mark down there that I think the quote from Instagram that I read earlier uh, articulates it more, more uh, better than I even did when I wrote this the other day, but it's because, you know, we all have power to make a difference in our, in our society. Uh, and, and it'd be good to, to use it. And anyone who happens to work for Congress on here, if I say anything wrong or you have more insights on anything, feel free to chime in because uh, I talk to a lot of congressional staffers and interns and research these topics, but there's never a better source than people who are actually doing these things. So I see some of you on here. Um, and I'm going to welcome people to unmute themselves at any time because I'm literally going to do stuff like this. So in order to in order to talk about how one influences the federal government, it's important to have this general understanding of what the federal government is. So if anyone on here would like to unmute themselves and give me any piece of this picture here, uh, what these parts of the government are, what their role in the government is, I'd love to hear someone get it, make sure we're on the same page about this ba basic stuff. Hi, Eric. I can't turn on the camera right now, but it's really good to see you. Okay, thanks for being um, here. Okay, well, the three. So there's the executive, the legislative, and the judicial. Right. Do you want me to give a breakdown on each or open the door for someone else to chime in? Let, let's, let's run us through one sentence each so we can move on from, from this one. Okay. Well, I'm rusty. I haven't taken government since high school, so please excuse me if I say anything wrong. That's why we're doing this. I wouldn't even bother with this slide if I didn't think the people kind of knew this but needed to make sure we're, we're here. Let's see how rusty I am. Okay, well, the executive is the one that, I don't know the right word, but they're the one that enforces the yeah. laws. The legislative, they're the ones that make the laws, and then the judicial, they interpret the laws. Yeah, absolutely. So, okay, yeah, yeah I'm not that, that forgetful. <laughs> 100 110%. So laws laws are made in Congress, the House and the Senate both have to uh, to pass uh, a matching law for something to become law. 
uses the word enforce and it absolutely includes enforcing, you know, the executive branch executes those laws. We're gonna talk a little bit more about, about that. When would they need to be interpreted? Whether you or someone else, you know, are they, is the, is the court, are the courts interpreting every law that passes or uh, no, no. why would someone need to do that? Not to my knowledge. What I know about when the judiciary, you know, interprets a law is when there's a problem that comes to the table, when they're facing an issue in the courthouse, then it's time to interpret the law to make sure that they help enforce the law as accurately as possible. Yeah, exactly. I don't have a bunch about the judiciary in here because it's a whole other monster. I'm working on an online course that all prospective interns can take that has a little bit more about that. But yeah, basically when somebody sues over over a law and uh, there needs to be some review of either whether it was constitutional or not in the first place and or if the executive branch is implementing it in the way that, you know, Congress uh, intended. A uh, quick note, let's see, if, uh, we'll see if someone else knows. If not, Raquel, I'll get you back. The difference between the Senate and the House of Representatives? I'll try it. Awesome. Uh, the Senate has two senators for every state, which means that there's 100 senators, and yep. it's really more deliberative. Um, the They call it like the, what's the word, the most elite institution in the United States or something. I don't know. They call it something like that. Uh, the House of Representatives has 435 members, um, and instead of there being an equal number of members for every state, it's uh, proportional. So small states only get um, one representative like Wyoming and larger states like California get um, like 53 representatives. So it's based on their population. Um, and it's a little bit more partisan and a little bit less deliberative, at least that's, that's how it used to be. But now these days they're both pretty partisan. So yeah, you're absolutely right about everything. Senate has this reputation of being a little more classy and collegial, but you know, whether or not that's true right now, uh, I would defer to someone who's, who's on that floor every day, but you're absolutely right that, uh, uh, the it's the compromise. I'm reading the Hamilton biography because I saw the Disney Plus version of the play and and inspired me to try to take this this thing on. Very and nice. A very lot nice. about the intentional structuring of this uh, so that the new the new U.S. government could be accepted by all states because some you know this was the compromise that some states would have equal rep in, in they would have equal representation regardless of size and also you know other people wanted to be based on size so this kind of does. This kind of does both. What is this madness that we're looking at here since we're still going to dig a little deeper into Congress? What is this picture? Is that the Florida Senate District? Senate? Oh, no, it's it's the federal Congress, congressional. Yeah, so this would be the House of Representatives District, so as you know, the two senators, as you pointed out, are for the whole state. And uh, so this is just a snapshot of kind of southeastish Florida that I would grab from Wikipedia or Google or something. So, um, you know, you know, like uh, 26 has FIU. It's represented by Debbie Mercasel Powell. 25 has a lot of parts of Hialeah that's represented by Mario diaz uh so on and so forth. Uh, anyone have any insight as to why these shapes are kind of so wonky as opposed to like nice even squares? I think, I don't know about, I don't know if it's gerrymandering. Is that, okay. is that we're going to, yeah, that's what it is, gerrymandering then. Yeah. Anything else about gerrymandering? Okay, I don't want to, what I recall is that it's where, you know, representatives essentially draw out who they're going to take care of. They are the ones who deliberately choose who they're going to represent. And so there's a good thing and the bad thing when it comes to that. I, I don't know if you want to wait for someone else to discuss that good thing and the bad thing. I can give you a little bit. Well, cool. I'll start with like how this even is technically possible and how this works. It's, uh, uh, you know, in order to know, first of all, the reason this is here is because if we're going to talk about how you can influence your elected official, you need to know who your elected official is. And it could be different than your neighbor one street over uh, because if you cross lines uh, from 25 to 24 somewhere in Hialeah, you know, it's, it's, you have to know yours and you have to know kind of the composition of your district and what's going to speak to your member based on the overall type of people, uh, you know, uh, in terms of their, their leanings and stuff like that. So first of all, what happens here, and this is something I honestly didn't realize till recently. So what I did know that the census is obviously a census year after every 10 years of census, um, the states are reallocated how many representatives they have so that every 10 years that proportionality uh, stays there. So the other thing that I didn't honestly realize till recently is that the 
the numbers of people in each district are uh, have to be more or less equal. So all of these districts have about 700,000 people in them. So, uh, you know, Florida will get X amount of uh, representatives. And then the state of Florida, this is not the, the, the federal, you know, the Congress uh, developing this, the kind of state legislature has the power to say, okay, we have this many, we're going to divide it up this way uh, so that there's an equal number of people. And, and uh, uh, you know, that's not automatic. Like there has to be a way to decide how you're going to break it up so that, that it's, it's even when obviously some are smaller because there's more people and some are bigger because there's, there's less people. Uh, what some states do is they've uh, taken that power away from the legislature towards a bipartisan or nonpartisan commission because uh, as you were getting at, what gerrymandering is, is when the state legislature is in charge of doing this, there are ways to try to make the district so that the party, their party is more likely to get elected because they know based on these neighborhoods that people are more likely to vote for them. Um, that's obviously uh, not a good thing. Uh, from my understanding, it's really only illegal when it could be proven that it was done around racial boundaries. That's not legal. But, you know, it is a subjective process. So there's a certain amount that somebody could legally get away with with, with doing that because you have to draw the line somewhere. Uh, so those are those are congressional districts. Um, um, and so moving into kind of what Congress does. So we have these 435 people in uh, the House, 100 in the Senate. And we've determined from the last side that they are the ones who are responsible for making the laws. We'll talk about uh, uh, executing those laws a little bit. And, uh, you know, two, two things that exist in uh, Congress that I guess are, you know, relevant to know and keep track of outside of your own kind of what your members doing are both committees and caucuses. Uh, committees are kind of the more official and formal, you know, areas of jurisdiction where when anyone introduces a bill, um, that bill gets referred to one or more committees depending on the subject matter that bill de deals with. And that committee is the first kind of body to, um, um, you know, decide if that bill is moving forward, if that bill needs markups or edits, et cetera. Uh, one of the things that I learned upon, you know, being in DC for going on two years now that I didn't realize is, I mean, I obviously assumed that within one committee, there are both Republicans and Democrats. But the thing that I didn't really know was that uh, it's kind of formally structured that the party that runs the whole Chamber of Congress runs all those committees and that, that uh, has a certain structure. So what party currently controls the U.S. House of Representatives? Democrats. Right. Yeah, Democrats control the House, Republicans control the Senate. So what this means in the House, at least, um, which is the body I found really, find really interesting personally, people, you know, might think the Senate's more procedures. I find the House fascinating. It's 435 people duking it out over our laws. Um, every single committee in the House of Representatives, the chairperson of that committee is a Democrat because when your party controls the House, your, your party controls every committee with the chairperson. And I'm sure you probably heard on the news or, you know, CNN is streaming a, a, a hearing or something that there's a ranking member on the committee. And the ranking member is the highest ranking person on that committee from the minority party. So in the House right now, every chairperson is a Democrat, every ranking member is a uh, a Republican. They're kind of the first place that these people go. Um, each, the, the minor, majority minority staffs, this is both interesting and a kind of career thing to know, have their own staffs. So the chairperson has a staff. That would be all kind of Democratic supporting people. And the ranking member has a staff that's kind of Republican uh, oriented people. And so you can apply to, to work on the staffs of either uh, of either thing. And, you know, they could flip from majority to minority after an election or vice versa. They also have their own website. So, you know, if you go the, the, the house, the committee on transportation and infrastructure, which sounds like this shows you how partisan the structure is. It's not just the people, it's how it's structured. The Twitter for the uh, house committee on transportation and infrastructure is transport Dems. Uh, because Democrats are running it, everything that's going to be coming out of any official committee website or Twitter is from the majority, and then the minority has their own, like, transport Republicans Twitter, etc. So if you really are interested in a, a particular, like, topic, following the social media feeds of both sides of a particular committee would be really interesting. And every committee hearing, they're having hearings all the time, are live streamed. I'm sure when the impeachment was going on, for example, you couldn't turn on the TV without seeing these live uh, streams of, of that hearing. 
but really that's just one high, very high profile, uh, you know, committee hearing. Everything that, you know, a finance committee or transportation or environment or banking committee, that they do is streamed from those committees' websites and, and you, can, you can watch them and uh, really as a way to uh, understand the process of Congress and how the rules work and how the voting works, but also to know what, you know, they're considering and stuff. Stuff like that. Um, outside of passing the laws, because you know um, the budget is kind of a law. Um, before moving off from Congress, it's really important to understand Congress uh, as the part of government which controls all of the money. The kind of colloquialism for this is that Congress has the power of the purse. People sometimes say, um, but um, you know the you know the, the federal agencies can spend money, but uh, our our budget is. Uh, is decided by Congress. They they control the money. Um, the I, it, I'll just say here so we can get off of this topic that uh, so the process basically here is you know the, the departments, the federal agencies, which we'll talk about in a second, obviously want a certain amount of money. So so each department kind of tells the president, tells the White House, this is what we would like in our budget for this year. The president then puts together an entire, this is what the, the president would like, which takes into consideration all the department and agency stuff. And then that goes to Congress. Congress doesn't really do anything uh, with that. Uh, that really is a political message that the, the, the president would like to see this in the budget. Uh, and then Congress goes ahead and is the one who actually determines the budget. Uh, the way that this is supposed to work, and this is a super complicated process, I barely understand. If this fascinates you, you can do more Google research and stuff on this. Uh, the federal budget every single year consists of 12 separate bills. And, and every year, Congress is supposed to pass these 12 laws that outline how the money's going to be spent for that year. Uh, that's the process. Uh, in reality, as we often hear about government shutdowns, and another one is apparently looming now, um, the Congress very frequently fails to go through that whole process because they can't agree on uh, those 12 bills and uh, gets into things called continuing resolutions where they basically say we're going to keep funding stuff the way it was funded before until we decide to pass the budget in the future. My main takeaway point here, not being any of those details, but we talked about the three branches of government before. Congress is the one that controls the money and that's kind of important to know. Any questions, comments, feedback, corrections to anything I said people might know about Congress? Cool. All right. So, like I said, we're not going to go into judicial too much uh, today, but, uh, you know, federal agencies that actually implement these laws are important too. So I do have a, a question of how many federal agencies are there. I'll give you the hint that this picture is not the full list of them. It's just uh, one picture that, that shows a lot of them for illustrative purposes. Anybody know how many federal agencies there are? Guesses are fine. I know that nobody actually knows this number, so you're welcome to give your best guess, especially if you haven't said anything so far. I guess. I have no idea, but if we're counting ones that aren't part of the cabinet that are like EPA, mm -hmm. that's just all, yeah, all of them. Mm -hmm. uh, 30 or 40. Okay. One more guess. Higher or lower than 30 or 40. Does anyone, somebody tell me at least higher or lower than 30 or 40. My godmother is guessing 25. <laughs> okay. I'm glad that she's participating. So we have, tw so, so in general, this audience is guessing somewhere between 25 and 40. The answer, and I'm sorry for giving you a question, is nobody knows. However, there are hundreds of them. Um, so it was pointed out that uh, a, a small group of them, uh, a lot of the ones that are on the screen here are uh, cabinet level agencies. Uh, what that means is that the secretary of uh, of uh, certain agencies sit on the president's cabinet, the president's closest advisory board, um, and, uh, and, and that's, that's a few that you might have heard of, like some of these. There are also you know, hundreds and hundreds of independent agencies that are not part of the cabinet, but are federal government agencies. I picked these three because they are ones that don't even necessarily sound like federal agencies uh, to, to kind of illustrate some of them. So the Corporation for National Community Service and a lot of them have like words like corporation in them, but they're, they're federal agencies. Uh, the, the, you, you might not have heard of the Corporation for National and Community Service, but you might have heard of the AmeriCorps program. They are the federal agency that runs the AmeriCorps program. The Export-Import Bank of the United States sounds like a bank. I mean, is a bank, I guess, but it's a federal, a federal agency that um, 
does banking and loans financing stuff to help encourage the export of, of American made goods abroad. And uh, the Japan US Friendship Commission, uh, an FIU uh, alumna and a former colleague in the Office of Global Learning, Bahia Simons Lane works for an entity that's part of that. Possibly the smallest federal agency, uh, there's about three employees that works for that organization, but it is a, a federal agency. You know, she's Bahia at you know, JUSFC.gov. And, um, so it's an endless number. They're constantly changing. They're opening and closing, you know, even without notice, uh, a lot of, you know, public notice. Um, so the federal, the, the executive branch is a quite extensive, uh, quite extensive thing. Now here's a interesting question and I'll pause to see if anybody knows the reference that I have uh, on this picture here. Like what, what the heck is going on here? Why would I paste this wild picture into this? Um, was this during the the net neutrality debates? Yeah. Yep, yep. So, uh, and so who, do you know who that is? In the, I mean, the, the, the enormous parody one is John Oliver, but do you know who, or at least the position of the person actually using this mug and what he would have to do with net neutrality? Yeah, Alexander got it um, with the, it's a Jeep pie. He was the... Mm -hmm. He was the head of the FCC? Yeah, chairperson, I think. Um, and I think still is, but I don't know if you have to Google that because nobody can talk about everything. Uh, yeah, ridiculous mug. So yeah, so we see there that, you know, net neutrality, I don't know if any of us really understood it like fully. I'm sure some of you did, but that's, you know, we've all heard of it. And that gives you an idea of the, the FCC, a federal agency, you know, controls some aspect of our lives, in that case, the internet, and they had a decision to make about it. So I have this question here because we talked about who makes the laws. Do federal agencies make laws? I know I have a reputation for trick questions already with the executive branch part, but give me an answer and a justification. Federal agencies make laws. I would guess that they can pass them, but not, not like, I mean, like give, it was, is it like a bill? Like they can like make them, but not like officially pass them. Okay. Uh, certainly reasonable, and, and, and that, that does give me entree to say something I wasn't even going to say, where certainly they can, you know, try to get Congress to pass certain laws. A lot of federal agencies have congressional relations people that, in addition to the budget, can express to Congress, you know, our agency could be more efficient at this or that. But yeah, federal agencies themselves have no even informal way to, like, introduce, uh, bill or anything like that. So the technical answer, depending how you define laws, is no. However, they do implement regulations, also known as rules. Those are like interchangeable terms, regulations and rules. And sometimes regulations and rules, especially in legal settings, one of uh, our DC-based alumni, who's a lawyer for the FCC actually, um, is teaching a, a, a master's in public administration class on administrative law. So to the extent that we can consider regulations, part of the law, which they are, lawyers refer to it as administrative law, federal agencies kind of make laws, even though you have not elected most of the people that work uh, at and lead federal agencies, um, they, 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 they implement regulations that affect us all. So when Congress passes a law, that bill becomes a law, then that uh, it becomes part of what's known as the United States Code. And you, you'll see like, you know, legal textbooks or something, uh, the, there's the letters USC uh, in the middle of a bunch of numbers. That's the citation for a federal law that was passed by Congress. Then those, the particular federal agencies have to figure out how to implement that law. So it's not just a matter of, okay, Congress says to, uh, uh, for you know, housing and urban development to help administer low-income housing, for example, let's just do it. They actually codify federal regulations that govern uh, low-income housing, for example, and those could be found in the Code of Federal Regulations, which also, uh, you, if you ever see number, number, CFR, number, number, that's a federal le regulation that was passed under uh, the offices of a, of a law. So they do have to uh, uh, follow the law, uh, but what happens is the laws are usually intentionally light on like very technical details with the intention that the people at federal agencies might be uh, better suited to figure out the nitty gritty details. So really, I think interesting, timely, and relevant to all of you as students example, 
was the CARES Act. Uh, you, I'm sure you've heard of the CARES Act. I'm sure you know FIU is giving out money from the CARES Act. Hopefully some of you were able to benefit from a small amount of money from the CARES Act if you needed it. So CARES Act, that was Congress. That didn't start in a federal agency. That's the House and Senate saying, we want to give this financial aid to all sectors of society during this pandemic. Of course, it's kind of ridiculous that it's now all this time later and we should have had more support and there isn't, but that's another editorialization most people seem to agree with. But the CARES Act did pass. Its citation is 15 USC 116. It's part of the United States Code. It's a law. Even though it's giving out money, it's a law that gives out money. And one aspect of that law was that colleges would get money and then colleges would give that students that money to students. Congress said that. The United States Department of Education which is a federal agency uh, with, uh, is really able to pass any regulation that they want that uh, governs that in a way that doesn't conflict with, or in their opinion, doesn't conflict with the law. So the, the Department of Education decided, and, and, and this you know, affected many students, including FIU students, DACA students can't get that money. And that was a federal regulation. That wasn't just Betsy DeVos saying, I don't feel this, we're not gonna do it. Uh, there's a citation in the Code of Federal, Federal Regulations, 34 CFR 668, which says that money from the CARES Act cannot go to students who are under DACA status. Um, this is interesting for a few reasons. One, because I think it's a very clear example of how a law is passed and then a relevant federal agency kind of makes further decisions within the scope of that law. But there also was immediate controversy over whether Congress would have wanted that or not. The bill, the actual law didn't say anything about DACA students. So um, on one hand, you know, there's people who would argue it didn't say you have to give it to DACA students. So the Department of Education is able to, to do that because it, it doesn't violate the law, they can do it. And other people, you know, saying, well, you know, that's clearly not what they meant. And that's the sort of situation we talked earlier, why did it end up in the courts? you know, uh, when there's conflict uh, uh, over what Congress meant or what a federal agency is doing is when it ends up in the courts. But, but this is the interplay between Congress and the federal agencies in terms of actual decisions being made. What are the laws of our country, how are those laws are implemented, uh, et cetera. Uh, you know, since we were talking about influencing uh, in all this process, it's important to note that uh, with very little exception, uh, the public can comment on all rules that are proposed by federal agencies. Um, I think another uh, cool reason to have John Oliver up here is I know that there are times that John Oliver has like compelled his audience to uh, go to the regulations site and to comment on, on certain things. You can go to regulations.gov. It's not easy. I'm not going to pretend that even I, working in the government relations office, read, can read everything on the site and, uh, and really understand what, what half these proposed regulations mean. It's there if you're following the news and you hear that an agency is considering something or this or that, uh, you know, you, you could, you know, try to go find it there. This is just a fun fact. It's not even that fun. It's just a fact. It's not a fun fact. I'm not going to lie to you. Um, <laughs> but I got this, uh, this kind of news alert in my email the other day, and I thought it was interesting because I was talking about the FCC anyway, and because I mentioned one of our alumni up here works for the FCC, that 85% of all public comments that were submitted over the past 10 years went to either the EPA about environmental issues or the FCC over uh, communications issues. I'm sure a lot of those were net neutrality. Um, so either you know the general public writ large is not really taking advantage of the opportunity to comment broadly or just really, really, really cares about the environment and the internet, which I guess is a, is a good thing. What happens if a federal agency implements rule that violates a law? We kind of talk about that. You know, Congress could either pass a new law that clarifies that or it goes to the, the, the courts. So, Eric, can I interrupt yes. you for a second? Please. We had a question in the chat. Um, yes, and I was, chat. You mentioned it, but somebody was asking can federal agencies lobby for laws? And I know that you know a little bit about the lobbying scene in, in DC. Do you want to talk really quickly about that? Yeah, that's a great segue into this section because, you know, clearly I'm about to talk about lobbyists and ask you all for what you know about lobbying. Um, I'm going to answer that question as yes. Uh, I, I, I would have to see whether it's legally termed as lobbying when a federal agency does it or not. I think it is. But uh, this, this relates to the one thing I did say earlier that answers this question, but I didn't use that word, is that a lot of federal agencies have and either an office of congressional relation, relations or an office of intergovernmental affairs. And so there are people 
at federal agencies whose job it is to monitor what Congress is doing and how it could affect them and to help communicate to, to you know, congressional committees and uh, uh, what that agency, you know, believes laws would help it do its job better. So that kind of being what lobbying is, uh, yes, federal agencies are, are, do lobby Congress. And I guess that's a, a, a good segue to uh, ask if anyone can give me a broader definition of what lobbying is, that kind of hints at it strongly. Um, what is lobbying? Um, I have a question, kind of the yeah. way you, you said about earlier. Yeah. So I'm not in law or political science, so I don't know if everyone already knows this, but like what you said earlier, when the aid for the students in the pandemic, how it wasn't specified about earlier when they made the law, how it wasn't specified that it could go to like the DACA students. Mm -hmm. Why can't you just go back and, and specify it afterwards? Like once it's passed, is it like set in stone or something? Like why? No, it's a fantastic question. Um, I think that um, that so yeah so when a Congress when a federal agency does something that that is not sure whether that is what is intended or not so obviously if it doesn't get resolved it goes to the courts the Congress can pass a new law that either clarifies themselves or changes their mind or they can take action to kind of defund a program so you know if something's happening they don't like there's no money for it because they control the money. I think that's an issue of politics where, you know, whether or not the original bill said it, you know, there could be, so there's 535 members of Congress between both houses, you know, there could be two or 300 of them that are like, whoa, well, I did not want DACA students to get this. You know, that's not what I meant, but that doesn't mean that there's consensus among all 535 people that, okay, we're going to go back and now pass that because you have the, the members who maybe agree with what the Department of Education is doing because of their political views about who should get taxpayer money, even though I know that that immigrants, including undocumented and DACA ones, pay taxes, um, or that didn't think about it and um, they know that you know, they're constituents. You might have, of the 535 members, somebody who's like, man, you know, well, it wasn't really my intention to keep it from DACA students. Um, and but, um, it sucks that, that Department of Education is doing that. But if I now go vote yes on a new law to say that they can get it, I know that I'm in a shaky district where people are, have weird uh, or uh, uh, there's a lot of split in my district about immigration and DACA that if, I, if the bill didn't say anything, I passed it, it goes to DACA students, you know, maybe that sticks to me, maybe, maybe it doesn't. But if I now go vote for something that says it has to go to DACA students, that has different electoral implications. So I think it's a, mostly a political answer to that question as to whether they would do it or not. I think, I mean, I'm in, I'm majoring in psychology and I think, I mean, like by leaving that out and like, and having that by leaving it out, it just makes it more easy to manipulate. Like having that, I think that's the main reason why like they, they can control everything by leaving a certain things out. And then, I mean, yeah. I, I, so that, I don't know, it's just. You're getting an interesting point, which is theoretically, you know, Congress could pass very, very, very specific laws and the, the executive branch would have uh, very little choices to make in this kind of regulatory process. Um, I'm not a political scientist either, by any means. My undergraduate major is criminal justice. My graduate degree is in higher ed. I work with interns for a living in DC. Um, but, you know, kind of from my understanding and reading and uh, proximity to people who work or intern in Congress, um, you know, there is, there are different schools of thoughts and a debate around should we have a stronger executive branch or a stronger legislative branch? Um, my Hamilton biography, you know, from, you know, 400 years ago gets into this where Alexander, Alexander Hamilton strongly believed, I'm not saying I agree or not. I don't, I don't think I agree. I think Congress is really cool because we elect those people, they pass the stuff. And I think I lean towards the legislative branch like I think you are trying to. But Alexander Hamilton believed the executive branch should be the strongest because popular will can really muddle anything getting done because there's so much debate and there's so much, you know, uh, you know, people get riled up about this or that. And, 
you know, they passed the laws there, but a strong executive uh, president and, and their cabinet, you know, needs to have the power for national security and national prosperity to say, here's how we're doing things. That's a school of thought. I can't really imagine being elected to Congress and thinking that you want someone else to be more powerful than you, but some people either inherently believe in that style of things or uh, support the current president. In this point in time or any other point in time where you're a member of a party in Congress, you, you want your president, who's the leader of your party, to kind of have the power to wiggle stuff, then laws end up having that sort of wiggle room for the executive to make some decisions. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no, oh, thanks for bringing that up because I find it fascinating and, and it's good to talk about. Anything else on anything like that or anything to talk about so far and or kind of uh, initial commentary on, on lobbying? Cool, well, I'm gonna speed through this a little bit then so we can have time to chat before we're at our 1.30. Um, lobbying is a very specific thing. Uh, it's lobbying really is going to a governmental official and asking for a specific vote in the, term, in the case of Congress or a decision in terms of a federal agency. Um, so this is, this is not like, oh, I'd like to talk about the environment. This is, you should vote yes or no on this bill about the environment. Um, anyone who does a certain percentage of this for a living, like it's the majority of their job, has to register as a lobbyist with the federal government. Some organizations employ lobbyists. FIU has lobbyists. Uh, my boss that I kind of mentioned in the earlier slide uh, when I talking about FIU and DC is, is a federal lobbyist because we will we'll go to Congress and say about a financial aid law or something, you know, you should vote for it or, or not. So you have to register if you do a certain amount of that. There are also um, firms. So this Aiken Gump group, it's actually a law firm, but it's the largest lobbying firm. They have a whole lobbying practice where companies, organizations, anyone goes to them and says, you know, we want you to lobby on our behalf. We're an environmental group. We're an oil company. We are a university. We are a tech firm, whatever it is, we're hiring you as a lobbying firm to keep track of the bills that could affect us and to push for the bills that would be uh, better for us, et cetera. Big business. Uh, something important to know is opensecrets.org. So there's a lot of federal regulation around lobbying. So since you're registered and you disclose the amount of lobbying, you can go to that site and you can see every organization that spent money on registered lobbying, what firm that what went to and what they lobbied on, so when it comes to influencing or you know, being more informed about these processes, there's a lot of complaining that goes on about the influence of lobbyists and lobbyists are evil. And it could, it's, a, it's a corrupt process, often in practice, uh, but you do have access to see um, uh, what's going on. So you can decide your votes for members of Congress who you feel might be too influenced by lobbyists and, or that you can uh, direct your support to companies that you think uh, are not lobbying against your interests, uh, et cetera. But I do wanna make the point that it is not an inherently evil thing. There's a lot of, I believe, corruption to it because you know, big business spends a lot of money to influence Congress and we are all individual people that don't have as much influence uh, by default. But all it is, all lobbying is, is asking for specific vote on something. And that is democracy. Uh, you know, you, you know there, there's not a system by which we have this democracy and we're not asking our elected officials whether we're an individual or a company or nonprofit to do certain things so that, that's all that lobbying is lobbying is one type of a broader concept called advocacy advocacy is the same idea but it might not be on a specific vote or even to a member of congress so i, I thought this uh web capture from results which is an anti-poverty organization captures that really well and oftentimes organizations will structure themselves into two legally separate organizations one that lobbies often called a 501c4 and one that doesn't lobby called a 501c3 because if you spend a lot of time lobbying you can't do tax deductible you can't take tax deductible donations so that's why they do that so results the 501c4 might actually go to members of congress and say support food stamps but the educational fund, which does advocacy but not lobbying, might perform research and publish papers about the topic. They might do public education campaigns like public service announcements or events. Um, and they might train volunteers and, and citizens who support the anti-poverty cause of how, like what I'm doing right now, they might do something with their own members about how government works and stuff. None of that would be considered lobbying, um, but it is advocacy because they're educating people and kind of setting people up to do their own own advocacy. Is that distinction uh, clear with everyone? 
So if um, you're working for, say, for results, would you be employed by one or the other, or is it all just one umbrella? Uh, in uh, it's, it's one of those weird things where it's kind of both. Uh, legally, they are separate entities. So from what I understand, somebody would be employed by one or the other and uh, working on one side of the house or the other. But in actuality and in presentation, it's one organization. So like you can see how this is all under results as website. They're not going to have a separate results educational fund website and results uh, 501c4 website. They might have pages for one or the other or whatever, but it's, it's usually not separate websites, separate logos. You know, everyone has the same business cards and URLs for the email addresses. And it's very much one organization, but for strictly legal purposes, you know, certain activities that organization does are housed under that uh, that separate legal entity so that they can still take tax deductible donations to the part that's not doing the lobbying. Well, I so find it fascinating. It's kind of a boring, uh, it sounds, but I find, I find it really, that really interesting. What's up, Florencia? No, I just wanted to add to even complicate things more. And I think I mentioned this in one of your presentations. If you work for an NGO, it depends many of them, like the one I used to work was federally funded and it was funded by different federal uh, funds and departments. So depending if the funding of your position or your department is the type of advocacy that you could do in Congress. So it gets more and more um, complicated. And then you also like get training when you do the rounds in Congress on what can you say and what you cannot say to not compromise funding or um, right to not, I don't know, not show that you have a particular agenda that compromises the funding that, that you're getting. So it gets, it gets complicated, but it's really, really interesting. Yeah. And everyone, of course, does have a particular agenda. It's just about right. following the rules and laws of, that govern the, the funding and expression of that particular agenda. And speaking of groups that have particular agenda, we see results here again. This is just a small smattering of the like thousands and thousands of advocacy organizations, because now we're moving into you influencing, you know, these things. So groups like Americans for Prosperity, which is right-leaning, Win Without War, which is left-leaning and focused specifically on national security type stuff, Results, which is poverty, NAMI, which is on mental illness, thousands and thousands of these organizations that fall on one side or the other politically and also focus on specific issues. Um, these A are often called grassroots organizations and, and what that typically looks like is there's a headquarters often in DC but not always and also a lot of local offices or chapters that might have a strong or even loose affiliation with that headquarter office. And, when, and um, so A, from just an educational perspective, these have a great influence on the laws that get passed because all these organizations are here in DC doing this advocacy and lobbying work but also you know these are types of organizations that you should be seeking out if you want to have a greater uh, impact on any issue that you care about from a certain uh, ideological standpoint um, because uh, working through an organization like this you're going to have more influence because when NAMI goes to advocate for a certain law that's great for the mental health uh, community like you being a member of that organization and you know having contributed to whatever voting uh, input process happened for them to take a certain stance and that your membership fees funding them to be able to do that you know there's more of an impact to you know NAMI going and saying we're representing our thousands of members than one individual person though you should still as an individual person kind of I'm going to get into that too so so this these play a big role in DC grassroots uh, organizations and there's something you can be involved in the business you know community also you know, our, our economy influences Congress a lot too. On the corporate advocacy side, the actual companies themselves, almost every company, I mean, every company lobbies, whether they have their own lobbyists, whether they contract one of these big firms or both. And there's also levels. So just to use Facebook as an example, no offense to Facebook, you know, Facebook's going to have their own public policy team internally that's uh, doing whatever they think is best for base Facebook. But then companies organize into industry organizations. So Facebook and every other tech company you've ever heard of, believe me, go to Internet Association website and see their list of members. Everything's there, TikTok, everything, um, uh, Airbnb. You know, then they're going to have members of companies that even though they're competitors, are going to be collaborating in the policy realm around what's best for tech companies. And then everything kind of comes together with the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, 
which is not a government agency. It often sounds like one, um, but it's kind of the main lobbying group for all companies, like private industry. Uh, in the, and it's one of the largest lobbying forces. And one of the other largest lobbying forces, it, probably the two biggest ones, the Chamber of Commerce, the other one is AARP. You may know AARP because of the, the membership and discounts at certain restaurants and stuff. AARP at its core is a, a lobbying uh, organization for older Americans. And they are very, very involved on healthcare, prescription type stuff, retirement, social security type stuff, major, major lobbying force. Um, on the opposite side, because these things like Facebook up to the U.S. Chamber of Commerce representing the companies, you have labor unions, which represent the employees and the workers of those companies and several, several federal agencies, including Department of Labor and the National Labor Relations Board kind of govern uh, labor unions and labor union lobbying and, and stuff like that. So, you know, people who are part of a union at their job are also involved in this uh, public policy process because those organizations do a lot of, uh, of lobbying and public policy advocacy. Um, you know, I mentioned the, the great impact that working through like a grassroots groups can have. Uh, one uh, couple points for if you want to reach out to your member of Congress, which you absolutely should do, and not just your member of Congress, but locally too. Uh, you know, I uh, have now in the, the pandemic's been a good opportunity to really research who these people are and what they're voting on. I've in the past six months contacted my county, my county representative, my state house, my state senate. So you can do this at the local level too. Here's a couple of tips. One, um, you know, the more calls the better. Uh, one of our interns in the congressional office told me in that person's office, if there are 15 calls about a particular issue, that member of Congress will take it very seriously and it could influence their vote. That's not across the board. Any member of Congress can do whatever they want. They can take it seriously with five calls or they could say, screw people, I'm not gonna eat. I don't want my staff to even tell me who called. Um, but I think that that 15 number is probably pretty, uh, you know, there are other offices like that. And, and, and uh, so one, you know, try to amplify your voice by either working with one of these grassroots organizations. So that's tens, that's hundreds of people calling or a letter coming from a membership of hundreds or thousands of people. But even if you're not through one of these groups, I'm not like super involved in some of these groups. I follow some of them. I use their information to guide what I do and donate to them sometimes. Get other people. If you have friends in your district that you're all Mario diaz Ballard's constituents in Florida 25 and you have similar viewpoints, you know, have a WhatsApp thing where you say, hey, I'm going to call Mario's office about whatever. If you guys agree with me, call too. So, you know, you can get five out of those 15 people calling just by doing something like that. Even though I'm supporting these uh, advocacy organizations, do not use form letters or call scripts that these organizations put out there. I'm sure you get these in your email all the time. I'm sure you get text messages that say, click here and write your member of Congress. We've written the email for you. Just put your name and email in and we'll send it. Don't do that. You can take what they've pre-written, you can borrow a stat from it, you can take an idea from it, exit out of that, go to your email, have a document with the email addresses or the web form links for all of your elected officials and send something directly yourself. One, a lot of the reasons that those organizations do that is so that they, they get your information for the mailing list and stuff like that. They legitimately want you to have an influence, but uh, anyone who's worked for these congressional offices will tell you, getting 100 of the same letter does not show that uh, individual citizens care about this, that, that people are clicking buttons. So your own message would be much more useful. Um, uh, you know, do try to make sure that the office you're, you're contacting has some jurisdiction over the topic. Um, uh, you know, it's really hard to know for sure, but like, you know, if, if make sure before you go to your federal person that it's not really a state issue, if it's not, if it's not a state issue that you're going, you know, vice versa, it's the right level of government, so to speak. If you get it wrong, you get it wrong, and hopefully a staffer would respond and say, hey, you know, Congress cares about this. Uh, this one's more of a local issue. Maybe you should reach out to her there. Or maybe they can help even at the federal level in Congress because they can provide advice and stuff. Uh, but try. And when possible, because maybe there's not a piece of legislation that's currently under consideration, if there is one, try to find out what it is and say, I would like you to vote yes or no on House bill or Senate bill number whatever, as opposed to just saying, I care about racial equity. I care about 
uh, you know, something with the pandemic, because uh, that's something that a staffer could easily tally. You know, 10 people said yes, five people said no, here's people who called for today. So those are, those are some tips for impact. I know we're kind of out of time-ish. I'm glad to stay at answering the FIUDC questions and stuff. Hopefully some of this was useful. Another set of organizations that's really kind of important to know in terms of DC policy world is think tanks. Think tanks are organizations that produce a lot of research and information about a variety of topics. Um, so their reports are really good for having facts and having information as you write letters or call people. They're also great career opportunities because for somebody just graduating undergrad, they have a lot of entry level positions and communications and social media and event planning and fundraising and stuff like that. Uh, and then uh, from a, somebody graduating from a graduate program, they have a lot of jobs and research and data analysis that actually drives the research. So I uh, would not be able to end a DC oriented uh, presentation without mentioning that think tanks exist. Also, if you live in DC for a job or now online, there are constant free events where you can constantly be hearing really informed panels and stuff uh, like that. That's the meat of my kind of how government and advocacy works presentation. Um, I don't know if uh, my global learning friends are going to force this to shut down or not. I'm glad to answer questions. I'm glad to talk more about the hey. interning, interning in DC part. This is what's so interesting. And we did have those um, technical issues at the beginning a little bit. So if you don't mind, and if you guys don't mind um, staying on, of course, we are respectful of anyone's time. But I think this is super interesting. Interesting. So no, we are not kicking you out. <laughs> Awesome, awesome. Yeah, so yeah, people have to go, you have to go. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to breeze through the interning in DC bit so we can get to the end and just chat. Uh, but uh, like I said, FIU can DC, D, in DC can help people uh, with getting a DC internship. Eric, I'm um, so sorry to interrupt. I have to leave soon and I would really love to ask you this question. Is it okay? Yeah, go for it. Thank you so, so much. I learned about the Hamilton Scholars Program and I know that we have to take a course for it but I want to know, will there be any College of Communication courses that we can take to complete the program? Because Good I question. read on the web page that you guys are like working on trying to make a communication elective. Yeah, so uh, right now, um, the course that uh, is part of the Hamilton Scholars Program is an Honors College course that even people who are not already in the Honors College, uh, we have a way to get Hamilton Scholars into that course focused on government and policy making. So the students who are in the course right now, which is the very first time, are all identifying a policy area of interest to them, um, going through what congressional committees and federal agencies and specific people in those entities have influence over that issue. They're going to be inviting guest speakers to that course based on each person's issue area. And the course culminates in uh, you know, a book of what the Hamilton scholars as a whole developed as policy proposals. That's the current course that all Hamilton scholars take. Uh, yeah, we would love, I mean, and, and people who are in the Hamilton Scholars Program can still take any communications or Carter courses online and during that semester and stuff. Uh, yeah, there is an idea of a specific government communications, policy communications type Carter course that students could choose between and do both. Uh, but right now, that's the one course that all Hamilton scholars take is that honors uh, course called the Washington Seminar. Thank you. Uh, and I, I guess I'll address the Hamilton scholars program a little bit first to say like, like I said earlier, we support and help all students and alumni in terms of finding, applying to uh, internships, support during their internships, events during their internships, professional development networking. Uh, every fall and spring uh, semester, and this is brand new, this fall cohort's the very first one. We also have our Hamilton scholars program. So this is for people who are a little less exploratory in terms of, oh, I'm applying stuff in DC, I'm figuring myself out. This is, you know what issue area you care about. It could be literally anything. Uh, we have people now from health, uh, women in STEM, cybersecurity, national security. I mean, if there's an issue you care about uh, and you wanna take the course I've described and you're like very, very committed to the whole thing, you can apply to our program first um, while applying for paid internships. Uh, we accept you into our program. We then, if you haven't landed your own paid internship by the time we accept you, we really, you're our VIPs. You know, every week we're communicating, what can you apply to? I'm sending you stuff, I'm getting to know you. We're making sure you land something. You take that course. The other interns are not taking that course. Um, there's a scholarship where we're reworking the scholarship so that each Hamilton scholar kind of gets the same amount total. So it'll be a certain amount of money 
uh, and then whatever your actual employer gives you is like subtracted from the FIU stipend so that each Hamilton scholar is getting, let's say $3,500, but that number will be communicated once we uh, get it out there. Um, and um, just more structure around here's a great housing option. If people do their own housing and stuff with Hamilton scholars, you know, we hope that when things are more in person and uh, that you know, ones who would choose to live together, we could help make a community around that and, and, and things of that nature. So that's the Hamilton Scholars Program. I just added the bios to this hamilton.fa.edu website of our current fall, fall 2020 cohort. You can get an idea of what they're doing. You can read out all about how this program works. Um, Eric, and we can, we, can, uh, we can help you with internships regardless, but it's a great program, yes. Eric, is there a limit as to how many students you accept in the program? Uh, the, uh, it's uh, 10 to 15 students right now. So, I mean, there's, uh, you know, a little room to take more if there's some good one, you know. Uh, but yeah, the cohort would be maxed out at 15. I think we have 10 right now. It's our inaugural, inaugural go around uh, at it. And I have another quick question. For students who aren't sure that they want, are ready to move to DC, but they kind of want to explore, I remember you have something before the Talent Lab. Is the some kind of community here in Miami that you start to communicate with students. Can you mention that really quickly? Yeah, absolutely. So if you go to talentlab.fiu.edu, mm -hmm. we have a lot of direct domains to go to specific pages on our site. Talentlab.fiu.edu is the best site for all of our student stuff. You're going to get there. You're going to see here's fly-ins, which by the way, apply for our fly-ins, please. Uh, internships and Hamilton Scholars, they're on the Talent Lab page. If you go to the internships page, there's two different buttons. One's for if you already have a DC internship, even if we didn't get you, help you get it, we want to know about it so that we can invite you to all of our events and invite you to the office if you are in DC in person. The other one is, are you interested in DC internships? Question mark. And when you fill out that form, it asks you all sorts of questions about what your goals are, what your passions are, if you already know some places you want to work, do you already know what semester you want to be here, so we can really get to know you. And that makes you part of our talent lab prep network. It's a very kind of informal group. It's not like there's like, you know, talent lab prep network meetings, but that's gonna make sure that you get our newsletter if you don't already get our newsletter. And in our newsletter is where all of the internship postings that we know about go. So if there's a DC internship that's paid that I've heard about, it's gonna make it in our newsletter. That's where all of our fly-ins get announced. So obviously you have all heard about our fly-ins uh, for this semester because you're at this event. But if you hadn't made it to this event, if you were on a newsletter, you'd hear about all of our clients that are open to all students, um, all of our own professional development events. So like this type of event that I'm doing as a Tuesday Times Roundtable for Global Learning, we host a lot of these on our own as well that don't even have me as speakers, that have actual experts and know stuff. Uh, <laughs> so uh, we, we, on our YouTube page, there's ones we've done recently. We had a great one about strategic communications campaigns with the guy who ran the Got Milk campaign for 10 years. I'm planning one now with NASA. Uh, we have alumni interns and fellows at NASA. So I'm putting something together about, uh, you know, NASA's role in the government. You're going to hear about all of our uh, events. So that newsletter is something that you want to, to be on uh, if you're interested in DC at all. And then uh, it's not just like pumping out the newsletter to you. Being part of this prep network is myself. And uh, my colleague, Travis, who's our graduate assistant and also a global learning uh, medallion uh, graduate, um, really work with you. Uh, you know, if you felt this one, you'd probably get a phone call from Travis. He, he, he likes the phone a lot uh, to a degree that sometimes millennials don't identify with. So you might get a call from Travis that says, hey, I, feel that, I saw you fill out the form. Let's talk about your goals and stuff. Let's talk about the different programs that we know. Um, and uh, do you want me to look at your resume? You send your resume to Travis. He helps you with your resume and interviewing and all that kind of stuff. Because if you want to get here, we're going to get you here. And uh, uh, I thought I, I had an old slide that was just kind of like sample placements of our students had been. I thought it would be fun since we're a few weeks in the fall now to edit that so that I could communicate where some FIU students are interning right now. This is all active, fall 2020, in Congress. We have with Congresswomen Shalala, Mercasel, Powell, and Wilson of Florida. Uh, and we have even across the country, we have someone with Yvette Clark of New York and uh, Congressman McClintock of California. Interesting thing to know about uh, congressional internships is A, you can go apply directly to any member of Congress. So you can literally just Google like Donna Shalala internships, Mara Diaz Bar internships. It's going to take you to the page of their site where you can apply directly to them. 
or you can apply to programs like Chile, CHCI, and CBCF, and a few other ones. Ch Chile is the Congressional Hispanic Leadership Institute. CHCI is the Congressional Hispanic Caucus Institute. They're nonprofit organizations affiliated with Congress. CBCF is the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation. They have their own programs where you apply to them. They accept you. They place you with a member of Congress. Um, the, they take fewer people, because like, uh, they might take five you know, people a semester or something, but they often have a much better stipend. They have a, a great you know, professional development program of their own and alumni network where you know, once you've done Chile or CHCI, you're part of that alumni network of any, anyone who's ever done it. So those are all great programs to look into, um, but also applying directly to members uh, is, a, is a, a good thing to do. Um, kind of a similar thing with federal agencies. So I mentioned NASA. SAMHSA is the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, FEMA, Federal Emergency Management Agency, Treasury, EPA. Same deal there. We have uh, interns at all these agencies. Some of them apply directly to those agencies. You can always keep track of agencies you care about their internships program, but there are also these third-party programs. So HACU, the Hispanic Association of Colleges and Universities, um, has a funded internship program where you apply to HACU, Haku then places you with a federal agency and they pay you. There's also the Washington Center, which uh, many FIU students are familiar with because there's a lot of promotion that happens in the Washington Center. Some of these federal aid, uh, interns are through the Washington Center. The Washington uh, Center has a program fee, uh, which is uh, something that these other programs don't have, um, but, that, but that a lot of students have had a good experience with. It's just one of, one of many options that exists uh, and um, you know, a particular one has a fee, but for people coming in person and housing comes with that fee. Um, and other, other things too, uh, companies, you know, MITRE and CRD, or CRD are companies, uh, DS Political is a communications company. So we have, we have interns all over the place. I can help you get internships. Our Hamilton Scholars Program is a structure you might be interested in if you're interested in taking this course while you do an internship and have strong policy issues. And, um, you know, I'd love to answer any questions here. I'd love to remind you to go to talentlab.fia.edu to learn more about Flyins Internships and Hamilton Scholars Program. Apply for Flyins this week because they're open. Email me at erica.fia.edu. We'll get you set up. I might refer you over to Travis to get you started, started with resume review and all this stuff. But, you know, we, we are here to help. I hope this was useful in introducing you to us and what we do. And I hope it was somewhat interesting about a uh, kind of uh, policy making, government, and lobbying as well. And Eric, may I add that also the flying CDC count for multiple points towards the medallion. A lot of the uh, internships, fellowships that you will secure to, through FIU and DC count as your capstone. So um, just think about that if you're trying to look for opportunities also to fulfill your global learning medallion requirements. Thank you, Eric, so much. It was really, really interesting. I lived in DC for a while and I, and I always learn things whenever I talk to you and you're experiencing DC now. It's, it's, it's really fun to, to hear. So thank you so much for joining us. Flor, any, any final words? Eric, again, yeah, like Jenny said, thank you. Um, every time I, we attended, we were talking with, with between some of us behind your presentation and we always learning new stuff. So we'll keep inviting you and keep tapping into you. Thank you thank to all of you that attended and stayed um, some extra time. I, 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 I hope you find this um, interesting. Anyone has a pressing question before we let Eric go? I know he put his contact info. Um, I hope to see you guys next week, but please, I wanna allow you guys um, to ask any questions that you may have. I have a quick question about the fly-in. Mm -hmm. I'm interested in it because we're just talking about it and I just realized what they were. But yeah. do I have to have any kind of knowledge about anything political? Because I'm really bad on that kind of stuff. I'm trying to learn. I wouldn't say about political. So all of our fly-ins have specific topics. So the two that are open right now are one is on racial equity, specifically from the advantage point of black leadership. The other one is on... I mean, they both have an equity focus. The other one, like I said, is examining how COVID and the election will influence primarily health equity, but also at the intersection of other things like educational and economic equity. 
those are the ones right now in case you see future ones too. I mean, they're on all sorts of specific stuff. So the last one we did before COVID hit was on defense technology. And before that was water quality. And before that was like Latin America. So I don't think you need to have political or like policy making knowledge because that's what we're here to educate you on. But you do need to have some knowledge or interest in that particular uh, topic because the main thing that help, makes an application be accepted for an interview or not for these programs is that we can tell that you're not just interested in experiencing DC, which is understandable because we love DC, we like to teach people about DC, but that you're someone who really cared about that topic. So using the COVID election one as an example, if you can articulate in the application, which will ask you things like, um, uh, what are some agencies you'd be interested in visiting and uh, what's like an article, a recent news article about this topic and why did you find it interesting? We can kind of tell from those answers that um, you care about the actual health equity topic or not. And even though I said like mention places you'd like to visit, it's okay to like Google that stuff. It's like, you don't have to know off the top of your head, it's not a quiz. Here's the federal agencies that deal with health equity. But if you've taken the time to prepare a nice answer for that, uh, you know, that's how we know, okay, you're someone who cares about this topic. And the reason that's important to us um, is, you know, you know, you're gonna be, these Zoom sessions are like what I've done today, where you actually get to talk to the guests that we, um, uh, you know, promote. And, you know, we want them to be talking to students who care about the issue that we've gathered them to uh, discuss. That's all, of course. Thank you. Yeah. Cool. Any final comments before we say goodbye? Cool. Thank you all for being here. Thank you. Thank you so much. A pleasure. Thanks, guys.